Happy Sunday, everybody. Welcome to our YouTube chat, the first one of the year. Uh, so I, I'm looking for some some really exciting discussion today on how on the compose uh, using color to compose with. How did I say that? Composing with color. Yeah, there we go. So we got folks coming in, and uh, we're going to get ready to gear this thing up in just a moment. I do. I want to to uh, do just a, a little bit of ex explanation at the very beginning, like I always do, to explain how the chat is done. Uh, of course, we have our membership and the YouTube membership uh, to become a studio inscribe uh, dude uh, subscriber <laughs> to become a studio insider subscriber. Try saying that twice in a row, and uh, you. You hit the join button that you see on every one of our YouTube videos, and uh, for a fee of four ninety nine fee, no, no, what would you call that contribution? <laughs> for a contribution of four ninety nine every month, you get a free video lesson from the lessons website. You get a little snippet, a little quick kind of a tip, a composing tip snippet every set third, uh, second Sunday, uh, every um, and then either every third or fourth, we alternate as you know, most of you know, most of the time our chats are on, on third Sunday, but this time it's on the fourth Sunday, so we alternate those depending on, you know, how the, how the wind's blowing, something like that. So that's how that goes. In other words, uh, uh, where I was going with this is, to, to make a comment or to comment in the chat box, you will need to be a member. Uh, and we do that just to keep s track of all the chat comments coming in, questions coming in, so that we can a answer as many questions as possible. So it's just a little thing we do here, I'm not trying to be snooty or anything, but just a little thing we do. Okay, greetings everybody. I see folks coming in looking really, really good. Uh, so the way the format's going to go, the way it always goes, is we have a topic and we try to keep the discussion pretty close related to that topic. And we begin the topic with a little short introduction video that I've made ahead of time. And then once the introduction video is over, we'll start asking questions. So we're going to play that, going to get that going in just a second. Uh, get ready with your questions. There may be a few to pop up during this one. If so, I'll make a note of it. Uh, and then at, at the on the other side of the video, we'll start answering your questions. Okay, Roger, are you ready to roll that video? Ready to go. Uh, roll that video. Composing, Composing with, with color, color means we're controlling, means we're controlling the roles, the roles that, color that color plays, in, plays our paintings. in our paintings. What are those roles? Well, color describes color harmonizes, and color guides the eye. When we say color describes, we're talking about local colors we see. You know the colors we know something to be, like the red barn here in Richard Schmidt's painting. Well, that's simple enough. We talk about colors every day. But when we say color harmonizes, that's a different story because it's color that keeps our paintings in tune. When we say a painting is in tune, we mean that all the colors are harmonizing with each other. It is color that creates harmony in our paintings. Now, even though something is a local color, such as this blue moth in a green environment, those colors can vary. The blue can still feel blue, uh, if it's a different kind of blue, for example, if it's a blue leaning towards blue violet, uh, and the green can still look green, even if it's a different kind of green. This is more yellow green we're seeing here, but if it were a more blue green, we would still call it green. What causes it to be in harmony is the same color of light, or our creating a painting where all the images feel as if they're under the same color of light. Now let's illustrate that here. This feels as if it's under a warm light, a light that maybe has a little yellow in it, like the sunlight. But if we put that moth under a cool light, 
here's what happens. Do you perceive how that goes out of harmony? How it goes out of tune? Let's do it again. Here it is in its warm light, where everything is lit by the warm light, and there's the cool light. Now, in today's culture, where anything goes, I mean, there are no standards left in the world of painting, except for those of us who still use standards in our painting. But in, a, in this culture where anything goes, our eyes have come, become accustomed to seeing things out of tune. But as painters, we learn to train our eyes to perceive the difference between everything in our painting and everything we are observing uh, being under the same color of light and how that goes out of tune, feels out of harmony, if it feels it's under two different light sources or two different kinds of light. Now, that's what we mean by color harmony. This brings us now to the third role of color, maybe the most important, and that is how we use color to guide the eye in our paintings. One thing that we notice uh, from master painters throughout history is that you can always depend on their using color to guide the eye throughout a painting, even when it's not noticeable. Uh, one of the masters of that, of course, is Richard Schmid. Another master is John Singer Sargent, who really masterful at using color for guiding the eye, and Sorolla. But let's look at the Schmid. How, what has he done here to use color to guide the eye? Now, it's obvious there's a red barn there. Our eyes will go to it, but our eyes flow around the painting as well. We're not just drawn there, and our attention is not just stuck there, as it will be if we just focus on getting the color of the image and don't focus on using the color to guide the eye throughout the painting. So what has he done here? Well, there are two major ways painters use to guide the eye with color. One is to repeat the color itself in that case, and Schmidt does this, I'll show you that in just a moment. Schmidt does this too, but uh, repeating the color itself in other areas of the painting will pull the eye around the painting, but also adding that color in to the overall scene uh, in such a way that the eye will move smoothly throughout the scene. I'm going to do a little hashing of Schmidt's painting here and show you what I mean. When I do this, do you see the difference between how your eye behaves between this one and this one? Let's do that again. Now, I will admit that there is some value difference, but we can change that value difference like that, but still our eyes want to stay right here. We are aware of this stuff, but do you notice that your eye keeps going back to this area right here? That's because he has used red, he has mixed red into all his other colors in the rocks. Let's take that away now and show you. We'll take this away too. Now, you see there's a slight purplish tone to the, to the snow here. He has actually used, uh, put red into the, uh, the, the shadow colors of the snow here. And you notice in the rocks, we see reds, red are very, very light. You, might, you would probably call it pink. In my language, it's a very light red mixed into both the uh, areas where the light's hitting the strongest on the rocks and in the areas of the shadow. And we can find that also mixed in the red mixed into the tree. We see red repeated physically right here in the chimney, and that's the sort of thing that the other way that artists guide the eye is to repeat it physically. So we can repeat the color to keep the eye moving throughout the painting in those two ways by mixing the color into other colors in the piece. Uh, we pull the eye around more subtly, and then we can repeat it like this. In the still life of Richard Schmidt's, 
he's done both things. He's used uh, the color itself, the mixing of the color itself, or the mixing of color within color. It's used, uh, you can tell that he's used red as sort of the environment for the still life. But he's also used the actual repetition of the color. One thing I want to point out about the mixing, notice in these green areas how we have variations of red repeated. That's the sort of repetition that Schmid was a master at sneaking in throughout a painting. But then we see the actual repetitions of these colors, red, red, red. And notice how this really uh, guides your eye within this environment of a lower saturation of red. These are higher saturations of red. And they they actually guide your eye. You've got a little bit down here and here. That is the physical repeating of red. Then we have the yellows repeated as well. And we have yellow repeated in the ground, in the background, mixed in here. That's a very low intensity or low saturation yellow. We see uh, repeated throughout, even in the plate back here. So we've got yellow repeated. And then we have the green repeated, and we have green repeated in the background. We, we see some green actually mixed in with the red in here, causing it to be very desaturated. Uh, so we have that. Now I want to do a little bit of hashing here to show you how the physical repetition of the color affects where your eye goes. And that's what we mean by guiding the eye. We're telling the eye where to go. Let's remove some of the repetition of red. Now, did you notice how now your eye is not going up here quite so much as it is now concentrating right in here? All right, we'll put that red back in, and let's get rid of some of the yellow. See what your eye did? Let's put the yellow back in, take it out. Now, do you know what your eye does? Your eye sort of begins to move like this. You're not going in these areas where that yellow was guiding you. Put the yellow back in. Now let's take some green out and I'll pay attention to what your eye is doing. You see now what your eye is doing? Now your eye focuses right in here. Not going, not being that interested in the outside, or uh, the negative, these negative areas of his still life. And now we have it back in his full glory with all those repetitions, each one playing a role to keep our eye engaged in the whole painting, with a strong focal attention right in here, but everything else equally important. Let's stop now and give you a chance to ask your questions. Okie dokie folks, let's Let's get, let's get some questions now. Do you have any questions about this whole business of composing with color? Did you know that color has three roles? A lot of people think that we just use color to describe images, you know, like we did as kids in coloring books. Uh, but in, when we're painters, they take color takes on those other roles as well. And, and so uh, I'm just wondering now, how many questions you're going to have about the roles of color. And there's something I didn't talk about there in the little intro video that I did want to mention, and that is that um, it, it, co the color in the painting, sometimes it would do it, be playing all three roles at one time. For example, in the Richard Schmidt painting that I showed you there, the red that he's, that he's mixing in with uh, uh, the surroundings of the building is harmonizing as well as helping guide the eye or make the eye feel comfortable roving throughout the painting, which is har what harmony does. So Cheryl asks, can you speak uh, to how tonalists guide the eye? Is it through variations of desaturated, warm, and cool? Tonalists are use not using color so much. They're, they're guiding the eye more. You know, there are many ways to guide the eye. Color is just one of them. And so tonalists will... Uh, a lot of times we'll be using the the placement of images, uh, and the uh, angle at which images are placed, 
the sometimes they will be using uh, maybe the repetition of images. So we, the the guiding of the eye overall is uh, happens with all the elements. All the elements can play a role in guiding the eye, and and so that. It's not the desaturation of warm and cool. Not so much in tone list. You'll notice that tone lists, uh, their work is tends to be desaturated. But what you when you look at when you see a tone list painting, it's going, it, it's most likely going to lean more towards either warm or cool. So it won't be the the temperature won't be necessarily playing a role in guiding the eye, or um, yeah, guiding the eye. All right, Marie says, regarding color harmony, do do we keep the painting warm or cool and not mix temperatures? No, there's always, if, if you don't mix temperatures, Marie, uh, it can get boring. So the, the temperatures are going to vary. Uh, they're going to vary the, within the range of the color of the light that's shining on the scene. Now, there's where we have to be careful. Because remember, uh, a, a single light source, the, the, the color of the single light source, plays that overall harmonizing role on the whole scene. Uh, but within that, we're going to have variations on cool and warm. And uh, so I, I hope that probably answers that. Um, if not... Let me know, and uh, I will expand on it a little bit further. Carol asks, we often hear mother color fall, mother color fall in guiding the eye. Is it too subtle to guide the eye and may or may and mainly harmonize? Mother color, uh, it pretty the pretty much mother color is what I was talking about. The way we use mother color, uh to harmonize the whole picture. And that is, in a sense, that is harmonizing, yes. But in a sense, that is also guiding the eye in the same way that I uh, pointed out that the area in, in surrounding the Schmid Red Barn is it's guiding the eye but making the eye feel more comfortable in the areas around it so that the, the redness of the barn, in this case, uh, so that the local color of whatever images are there don't isolate in their vision. Uh, so if, 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 if there's a warm light on the barn, but a cool light everywhere else, which is in essence sort of what I did there, then the, the images isolate, visually isolate, and that then creates a, a dissension. It's, it's, not, it's kind of stagnating the eye. I didn't know where to go. It's going to probably go to the, the biggest, brightest thing or the, where the most value contrast is. But, uh, but, by, uh, but we use that mother color mixing a little bit of the same color, whatever color is, is uh, whatever color we're working with, we will have one color pretty much mixed into everything else, which is the same thing if you think about it about uh, as the color of light, whatever color the light is gets mixed in. I hope I made that clear. Let me know if I didn't. I think you had Debbie and Carol's switch there. What was that? Carol. Carol. I, I just Debbie said. Debbie was mother color. Oh, uh, no. Carol says. Oh, did you get them switched? No, I think Carol's came up and then Debbie's. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. Okay, Debbie, Carol, whoever. All right, let's go to Carol says, we often hear paint what you see. How do you know what to actually when to actually introduce colors in the scene when you don't actually see it there. Um, Carol, we we painters, we train ourselves to see the, the nuances in the color changes. Yes, we're painting what we're seeing, but if we're looking at something that is under any kind of light, we're seeing how that light is affecting what we're looking at now there's a difference between look, between seeing and uh, what would you say missing? Uh, well, I almost said misinterpreting. There is a tendency if you see, for example, the blue sky. There's a tendency to generalize uh, an idea of what a blue sky looks like. 
and we will be looking at a blue sky, but rather than painting the variations of blue that we see in the sky, we will end up painting what we think uh, a blue sky is. In other words, a pre, a, a, an assumption or a preconception. So sometimes a preconception will block our ability to, for us to really see what we're looking at. And what we try to do as painters is to get rid of that preconception and allow ourselves to study, uh, to be able to actually see what we're looking at rather than to have a preconception notion of what we look, we're looking at interfere with what's there and what we actually put down on our canvases. And we do that by doing color studies. And, and, and a wonderful way to do that sort of thing is to use isolators, go out in the landscape, for example, and, uh, and use an isolator. And a wonderful isolator is your, is your hand right here. You can just make a little hole through your fist and you can isolate. Well, if you hold that in front of, say, any color, uh, green, red, yellow, it doesn't matter what it is, if you're looking out at it and you hold your hand there and you isolate a section and then you mix that color. Now you start mixing that color using principles of color mixing and if you just go and mix it, if you call it yellow green and then you go and you mix a yellow green, you might discover that your yellow green that you mixed was a preconception rather than what you really saw. You can compare what you mixed with what you're looking at. And the way you can do that is put a splotch of it uh, on a little strip of paper or a strip of canvas or just hold it up on your palette knife, close one eye and hold it right in front of that color you're looking at. Compare the two and that will tell you if you actually mix the color you see or if you mix a preconception of that color. So that's part of the, how we train ourselves as painters and, and that's part of how we paint what we see. Uh, let's see now. Oh yeah, that was Debbie. Never mind. <laughs> Cheryl. Pardon me, I'm going to cough here. <clears throat> um, Cheryl. Do you need both adding a color here and there, like a red, mixing it into the co uh, other colors? Do you need both adding a color here and there? like red mixed with other colors into the other colors as a mother color. Do you need both? Uh, you Are you talking about the actual, f what I refer to as like a physical repetition of the color rather than a mixing? Because I told you that there are two ways to repeat that color. Um, so it, it can be either or both. It's however the, the painting is working out. If you're... Uh, if you look at the photo of them, look at look at the um, look at my shirt, and look at those dragons in the photo. There, let me slide over just a little bit and look right there at that little area. And what is that? A rock? Yeah. Do you see that the red that's in my shirt? You see how that is kind of, well, that is a that is a kind of red. You see it repeated there. That the those dragons in this little area here, all of that is being harmonized with my shirt. It, it, without you really realizing it, uh, but also there's a there is in that scene uh, in those rocks there is there is that feeling of a red throughout uh, a little red mixed into it throughout, which is you can see you see right in here those little orange areas and then if we move up oh, where's my, okay let me get over here point. <laughs> I, here we go again with me having trouble. My image is backwards from yours, so me having trouble. Okay, see see all this orange stuff, and then if I go up, 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 up see there, see all this little orange is popping out, um, and there's a little bit of red in that mixed in that blue of the sky too, or else it would be uh, there's a little orange mixed in there with it, which has red in it, or else that sky would be really really high high saturation sky so we see you can you have you can do both and we use both and we use but we use them according to what the painting is calling for and according to what is needed to keep the eye moving within the painting rather than the high of the eye jumping around and also what we need in order to keep uh, the harmony within the painting uh, rather than have uh, uh, 
cools and warms our uh, individual hues, isolating out from each other and not relating to each other. So um, did I make that clear? Let me know. <clears throat> um, uh, Mary says, I got here a little late. What is mother color? Mother color is simply a term we use that means it's, a little, it, it, it's the mother of all the colors that are in there, meaning there's a little bit of that color mixed into everything you see. Uh, whether you realize it or not, you, you might not even know the color is there. Um, what? Quick tip, 238, mother color. Oh, good. Roger just pointed out. Check out quick tip. Did you say 238? Correct. Quick tip 238. I explained mother color. All right. Uh, Carol, do you think Richard Schmidt actually saw the red in the snow shadows? Or was it just his brilliance that introduced it? I do not know. Now... Uh, sometimes artists will artists will pick up on something they're seeing within the scene, or sometimes they will uh, artists will compose with color in a way that they know it makes it work. Now I've actually seen uh, uh, I was thinking about times when it snowed. Sometimes uh, when it when it has snowed, uh, sometimes there might be a slight purplish cast if the if they're uh, if it's an over slight overcast or it's late in the afternoon, uh, there might be a slight purplish cast, usually uh, depending if the, if, uh, if, if the um, sun is shining on a snow, snow covered uh, area, the, the, the shadows tend to pick up this color of the sky. They tend to lean a little more towards blue. But uh, knowing, knowing enough about Richard's process of thinking about color, I'm, I'm guessing that he adjusted that uh, the color within the area around it, especially where it leans a little bit more towards purple. Um, I, I, I have a feeling, I know for sure, that he was really looking for the harmony of the painting, more so than uh, the actual color of the, the snow that he was looking at. Uh, it's not necessary, uh, not to, uh, uh, it's just something artists do. We make adjustments according to what we're, where our emphasis is and according to how we want the painting. We remember the painting is not just a um, copy of what you see. The painting is an interpretation of what you see. And when we take that painting beyond just, uh, just copying, we're composing, composing. That's where, that's where the magic happens, is when we're taking the elements that create these images and we're composing with them beyond, many times, many times it will be, on, uh, be, be what we do there will be beyond what our eyes are actually registering. We'll be making adjustments in order to use that information to interpret what we're actually looking at. Uh, Cheryl, okay, I see, thank you, good. I'm glad you see. And Cheryl says, if you have a no 10, <clears throat> if you have a no 10 to add, a color, even though it may not be there, but feel it would add liveness. How do you get the correct hue? That's a notion. Uh huh. If you have a notion, not a good day. <laughs> oh, notion! <laughs> Lord, my, my head, my eyes. There you go. I was presupposing. <laughs> I had a, a, a slump. I see the uh, uh, the letters N O in front of a word. And I call it a no ten because I'm such a no ten fan. <laughs> Sorry, I, I read it that way too. Oh, y'all, yeah, that's all right. So there you go. Let's try that again. This is if you have a notion to add a color, even though it may not be there, but feel it would add live on it. How do you get the correct hue? Maybe use a slip of paper. I think so a little bit. I would use a slip of paper. Now here, here's the deal. You want harmony. <clears throat> If you have a notion a color would be there, you're not quite sure it's going to work for one reason or another. Yes. Pardon me, i got to clear the throat. <clears> throat> um, so the frogs are busy today. <laughs> okay, so, so yes, that'd be the best thing to do. Now, I, I, like, I, I use those little test strips I have, you know, all in the world are. They are a little, little shit, little, oops, <laughs> little slips of paper. Uh, that came out wrong. Uh, little slips of paper where I will, whatever color mixing, or whatever color mixture I have, I will paint it on the end, on the actual end of that slip of paper, 
and then hold that up in front of my eye and cl I usually close one eye and compare it to, to the painting. Now this time it's to compare it to the painting to see if it harmonizes. Uh, but I do that often either just with my paintbrush, you know, I'll, I'll uh, load that color on the back of the brush and I just hold that up like that, close one eye, hold it in front of the, the painting to see is that gonna is that gonna harmonize or on the back of the palette knife uh, wherever however you don't need anything fancy for that but that that that's that's how you can make it work and you may be surprised you really may be surprised and sometimes let me say this too sometimes if you have a notion you, notion not no tan notion that you want to add a, a color for liveliness uh, remember the the amount that you add is going to affect. So you might, if you add too much, it might not work. So go easy, add a little bit at a time to whatever, however you, whatever mixture you have there on your palette. A little bit of time to do this little test to see if, uh, if indeed it's gonna work. Okay, Carol, Carolyn, uh, if you have a scene of gray destruction of a building and have with one big spot of color yellow, such as a yellow umbrella, would you need to add yellow to the other parts of the painting? Um, it depends. This is back to the Richard Schmidt thing. What you have there is a whole, uh, it says strange gray. Yeah, what you have there is a whole bunch of neutral stuff. And then you have something there that's a whole lot more saturated. A single image is a whole lot more saturated. It may indeed uh, for, for visual harmony, it may be indeed, uh, be necessary to lean all that neutrality towards the warm or towards the yellow, the yellow orange. And it would still be very, very neutral, uh, adding, you know, almost uh, adding a little yellow ochre that's got yellow in it. So it's just a little bit of that warmth in there. And also taking into consideration what the lights do, or what the color of light's doing. Uh, but the, that's the sort of thing that um, you know, can be very much fun to work with. To just, just to what degree do you need to do that sort of thing? To keep that in harmony, to keep that yellow from totally isolating out from all that neutral stuff that's in there. Give that a try. Do, do a little uh, experimental painting, Carolyn. Where where you uh, you do that and you, you just kind of work it out and see what happens. I think that would be fun. Um, okay, so if we if we run short of questions, let's check the time. Yeah, we're we're good on time. Okay, um, I there's there's a there's an artist. I won't, let me I'm going to throw this in right now because uh, I think this is a good place good place to throw this in. There's an artist that I want you folks, if you don't already know about him, I want you to discover. Now, you know, I talk a lot about Richard Schmidt. He's the most contemporary uh, master. Well, of course, he we lost him last year or year before, whenever it's way too, way too early. But um, he's the most contemporary, real master of color, real master of all uh, composing and of technique of painting. And I talk about him an awful lot. I use him an awful lot as examples because he is such a master. Uh, as I same thing, same as I refer to um, some of the other masters, such as John Singer Sargent. There's a master of managing color and technique. But there's a, there's someone I want you to become familiar with, and and that is uh, Kevin McPherson. It's spelled M A C P H E R S O N. Real master of color. Real master of technique. And uh, he has a website, and but he's he's not the kind of guy that that promotes himself very much, very uh, uh, very what would you say self self contained guy, that uh, paints for the love of painting, and not for the love of self promotion. Like well, I won't go there, but anyway, uh, when when I would like for you sometime uh, go check his website out and take a look at his work and look at what he does with color. Look at how he uses color uh, to compose. Use and, and when you look at his paintings, uh, actually try to figure out what he has done there to achieve the color harmony, and act, and look for how he has repeated 
the uh, uh, repeated visible or more physical repetitions of color, we could say maybe accents of color, how he has done that repetition to keep the eye moving throughout the painting. Uh, when you go, when you go or you go to his website, and then you you click on paintings. There is one. Uh, I think it's uh, if if it comes up just like it does on if it comes up the same on everybody's screen, it would be the third one on the right at the top is a still life, and uh, that's a real good one to give you because he's got there he's got repetition he's got that an overall color harmony. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you'll see it. But within that, he's got little triangles of other colors. They're harm they're harmony. They're in harmony with the overall color. But he's got little triangles of, of repetitions of color, kind of like Schmid did in in his uh, still life painting we looked at in that little video. Uh, spell his spell this last name again. Okay, M A C P H E R. I think it's S O N. Oh dear. It could be S-E-N. I think it's S-O-N. Pretty sure. I'm not the best speller in the world. Uh, but uh, give that a try. Um, you know, it would be really, really interesting. Okay, Debbie's got it right there. There, I, I had it right. There we go. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you for that spelling. That goes out. I don't know. Does, does the chat go out in the video? I don't yeah. know. It does. Okay, good. So it'll be visible to anybody who who was watching this later after we do the chat itself. Good. Uh, so there, there's one place where you're really going to find a master. Now, okay, Cheryl says, in relation to Carolyn's question, which, which about uh, about a saturated color among neutrals? I've tried this, but not with neutrals in the background. It was not a, in harmony. It made the eye go crazy. You know, that may be interesting to try that with, again, Cheryl, and then using that, whatever the hue is of that uh, uh, really saturated color, the single image that's uh, more saturated, using the idea of maybe some desaturation version, desaturated versions of that mixed into the others, you might try experimenting with that to see if you could bring a, uh, an idea like that into harmony. I think it'd be a fun little game to play. Um, okay, what we got there? Ro okay, good. Roger has given you the link to McPherson's website. Thank you, Roger. That would be great. How would you desaturate yellow? Carol, Carolyn asked. <clears throat> How, okay. You desaturate any color, pull out your color wheel, and you have your you have your answer right there. Uh, Roger, you want to pop a color wheel on the screen just just a couple of just for a moment, and let me show you. Oops. Huh? There we go. <laughs> okay, let me show you. There you go. That, uh, on the color wheel, colors opposite each other, when mixed into each other, desaturate each other. So if you look at the wheel, I've got that di little diagram right here for you. So to desaturate yellow, uh, oh, can you put it so that I can point to it? Put it on top. Am I asking too much? <laughs> there we go, there we go. Okay, you see, you see how this this yellow starts out with a highly saturated yellow, and has a, just a little bit of violet added to it. It gets desaturated, a little bit more violet, desaturated, and so on until it will get neutral. Now there's one little caveat here, that is, if you want to keep the same value of the color you're mixing, you've got to raise the value of the darker value. The values need to be value corrected, meaning. That when you mix two colors together, if you're if you're if you're aiming for a particular color of the same value, those that both colors need to be the same value, or it's going to get darker or lighter, darker in the case of this sort of thing. So and and also something else to remind you of is that um, the desaturation is the desaturation will if if the color is exactly uh, complement exact complement. That's the desaturation that's going to happen. 
But if, say, if you're working with a, a yellow and you're desaturated, but if the purple that you're using is a little bit bluer, leans a little bit more blue, that that desaturation is going to go greener because the, the blue is going to mix with the yellow as well as the uh, desaturation. On the other hand, if, if when you're if you're desaturation desaturating, and, and you mix the red violet, if, if if the if the violet's leaning a little bit more towards red violet, then that neutral is going to lean to more towards uh, uh, towards orange or, or uh, yellow. See, red plus yellow equals orange. So it'll be a very desaturated color, but lean toward more towards orange. So there is that little thing that does happen because not. Very few, very, very few colors straight out of the tube are going to be exactly uh, 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 on-point registrations of their hue. Most of the colors we have in our tubes uh, will be will register in a hue range, but they will lean in one direction or another as they as they are positioned on the color wheel. Um, okay, so I did, I did I squeeze enough out of that one, <laughs> Mary Ellen. Uh, you're welcome, Carolyn. Uh, Mary Ellen, I realize that you can use these concepts in, at, concepts in abstract painting, but how do you decide where you want to lead the eye? Or is that a question? It's not off the topic. No, question off today's topic. No, it's not because uh, composing with color is a, it's also about guiding the eye. That That's an intuitive thing with abstract painters. Uh, it's an intuitive thing about, and the the intuition is what you're feeling. You want that where, what kind of pattern you're feeling. You want that color to move in, or uh, when you're repeating those colors. So you might have a sense depending on the uh, orientation of your canvas. You might have a sense that you would like the pattern to be more triangular. You know, moving more in a triangular. Uh, uh, movement direction uh, where and the eye will do this sort of thing around uh am I going off the screen I, the, the whatever the sh however the the tilt of the triangle goes is where how the eye will go around the painting and so it it would then that's just an example another example is if your intuition is I mean if you're intuiting that you have more of a circular feeling going on in the abstraction then you would arrange your range of repetitions in kind of a circular uh, 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 arrangement. And remember the circular arrangement, um, the circular arrangement can go in a circle. Let me get over in front of the camera here. Can go sort of in a circle like that. The idea is that the, the color is repeated in various places on the canvas so that it's leading the eye. But it could also it, it still be a circular arrangement if it were taking kind of an S route over the over the uh, the canvas, so it might be, or it might you know the S might be in various uh, uh, orientations, or it might be going in a C route, sort of like that, or it could be going in kind of a a U route, kind of like this. Uh, there are several ways we can use that curvilinear uh, or circular a movement within abstract painting and in realistic painting. In realistic painting, the only thing that's different is you're working with images, but you're doing the same thing as far as uh, guiding the eye goes. Uh, so it, it's more, but in abstract painting, it's it's more intuitive or more intentional what your uh, what your intention is with the whole piece. Carolyn had a thing about the desaturating yellow and comment said, but there's no other purple in the painting, do I need to add that too? And it's uh, not, it's no. Like no, 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 no. You're desaturating the yellow, but you, that purple serves only to desaturate the yellow. It doesn't show, it won't show in the painting itself, as long as you keep, as long as you keep it in the yellow range. So no, you won't need to add that purple anywhere else in the painting uh, if you're just desaturating yellow and nothing else. Okay, what tube color do you use for red violet closest? Me, myself personally, uh, my favorite red violet uh, out of the tube is uh, the quinacridone violet that Gamlin makes. That's my very favorite. And the reason it's my favorite is that it's transparent, it's dark, uh, and it, it registers in that beauty in a, just a beautiful uh, in a beautiful area of red violet. Red, it registers pretty close to what uh, what's on my color wheel right here. 
So that, uh, that's what I do. Uh, thanks, Diane. I must have answered, Marion. Did I? And, okay, Debbie says, thanks. Great. That's wonderful. That, that, um, I want to go back just a moment to um, was it Carolyn's question, uh, David. Carolyn's question about the adding if you add one, do you need to add it anywhere else? Yeah, the, the, that's the thing. Well, you know, when you're when you're mixing color, uh, you might be adding you might be adding a color just a, a color to another color just to affect that color, but it doesn't mean you've got to every, add it everywhere. Uh, we adjust individual colors in order to make them harmonize with each other or to do their job, whatever their purpose is going to be on the on the painting itself. So maybe I made that clear. Impret. Uh, I've seen color wheels skewed to exact complements. Do you recommend painting on our own since they very much uh, they vary so much by manufacturer? I think no, I think to begin with, get a color wheel that is a traditional color wheel, not one of those that does all that calculating and stuff. Get one where uh, where the colors are arranged traditionally in increment uh, in seven and uh, in twelve is a twelve unit where it's got the the primary colors, the secondary colors, and the tertiary colors. It'll have twelve colors uh, that a move around in a circle. You don't need that, I'm gonna say, you don't need that crap in the center. <laughs> There's so many of them will have all that stuff in the center. To, to do this, you do this. You don't need that. I always like, I like to see that cut out with an X-Acto knife and thrown in the trash. Uh, we just need that diagram of those arrangements of he, those hues, the way they move around the color wheel. We just need that diagram so that we can refer to it as a guide for how to mix, but uh, if if uh, you go on our website, the the lessons website at diamondmice.com, I have I have some uh, free color wheels there that uh, I that I created on the computer, and according to the computer, each hue is an exact saturated uh, registration. I can't guarantee how they come out on your monitor. <coughs> Monitors will. Interpret color different from monitor to mon differently from monitor to mo monitor to monitor, but they are in a PDF format. So you, if you have a printer and you can get your printer to print an exact registration, you might be able to print out um, uh, and uh, print print that out. The important thing is that you use it as a reference that you can register. You you're able to register in your head when you think yellow you're able to register that as a spectrum yellow, or is that what we call the exact registration of a high intensity yellow? And you can uh, know that directly across from that, its complement is, is violet. And the reason its complement is violet is because that violet is made up of the other two primaries. It has no yellow in it. So that means it hasn't, they, they are totally opposite each other, like night and day. All right, maybe I preached hard enough on that one. Um, okay, uh, painting your own. About painting your own color wheel, let me say this. <clears throat> get familiar with the color wheel first. You can't always get exact registrations from the tube colors, and uh, the tube colors will vary. Some tube colors, when mixed together, some of the uh, uh, opaque tube colors, when mixed together, uh, give you kind of a, a muddy version of what you're going after. And I can remember those, oh, those uh, cheap tempers that we had, temper paints we had as children. That's all, all the schools could afford, I guess. Uh, and and you try to mix yellow and, and blue to make green. It wouldn't come out green, but kind of a yucky green. And that often will happen. Like if you, uh, uh, if you mix a, if you don't mix a, a two colors that are, that are um, uh, uh, what exact registrations of each other, and that are not uh, they they can't have too much strong opacity. They can't lean one color to the other. Uh, then that could be a problem. And I'm just saying that re back in reference to creating your own color wheel. Uh, the, in our in our course on the academy called uh, 
cracking the color code. I do guide you toward developing your own color wheel so that you can have the experience of uh, of seeing how that how that goes, the relationship of one hue to another as it moves moves around the wheel. Uh, but anyway, I hope I'm not being too harsh about that. But uh, just caution, okay? All right. So have we run out of questions? Have we have our questions dried up on us? Uh, Cheryl, it seems that color it seems that color is the strongest composition guide for the eye. Does it indeed have the biggest impact since we place so much importance on color? Cheryl, I wouldn't say it has the biggest impact. I would say it works with the other elements. Uh, but it it I place the emphasis on it here because um, there there's often, too often, so much attention given to color as description, color as uh, describing what the uh, describing the using color to describe the images, but not paying attention to the harmony of, of those colors and not paying attention to how those colors uh, actually affect the eye on the canvas itself. There are other things like, for example, color, but color by itself needs direction in order to guide the eye, the element of direction. So which is more important, chicken or the egg? Is, more important, is, is the color more important or is the direction the colors moving in? Because just the color sitting there, not doing very much, it needs the direction to guide the eye. So I wouldn't say it's the most important. I would say it's very important how we use color as painters in order to create richer paintings, stronger paintings, better paintings in those terms, more expressive paintings. Uh, I think uh, um, getting that real sense of what color does, paying attention to what the color is actually doing in your painting makes uh it, it is a thing that makes so much difference um let's see where was it go well um while i'm waiting for the questions i want to also say say to you speaking of the guiding of the eye we have uh wednesday we have a workshop coming up that is uh, based around uh guiding the eye it's it's using visual paths for composing and we have three spots left in that workshop as of this moment that's unusual usually those workshops fill up within a week or two but uh january seems to be the time when folks kind of cut their budgets and do stuff like that so you might go go to uh diamize.com diamize.com <clears throat> and there is a, a banner on the front page of diamize.com where you can click and check out the workshop that's coming up. It's a live stream on uh, on, you, on uh, Zoom. We Zoom live stream. It's limited to the number of people who can participate. But it's uh, uh, the workshops are uh, usually about three to four hours long in the instruction itself. But they, the the workshops take a single concept like that and really break it down. To help you to uh, to understand it, and then there's follow up with the workshop where you do your homework, where you homework meaning you yourself then uh, practice or uh, do exercises to practice those principles, and then you have a one on one session with me as a part of the workshop where we look at your work and we and we um, we discuss what can uh, what you really learn and what you can do to enhance your learning further, and so on and so on. So I thought I'd throw that in in case there's anybody watching this. That, uh, by the way, if somebody's watching this three years from now, it's not going to do any good. <laughs> but that's the, that's the disadvantage of announcing things that are going to happen on these YouTube chats because this is being recorded and it will appear on the channel after it's uh, after we finish up. But uh, So it's on uh, Wednesday, January the 25th, 2023. That's for anybody who's watching this four or five years from now. <laughs> uh, beginning, beginning at 11 in the morning, a, uh, Eastern time. All right, so I got that out of the way. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Mary Ellen, following up on Cheryl's last question, I frequently I fr have frequently heard that value contrast is the most important compositional element. What do you think about that? No. 
I think it's very important. Value contrast is very important because the value contrast enables us to see if the value is not contrasted, uh, that there we we there we can see a, discern a little bit of difference when there is a hue contrast at the same value. But the main visual element that enables us to see everything else and how everything is working, whether it's abstract or realistic or anything, any kind of any style of painting, uh, the value contrast is very important. I might have been guilty myself of calling it the most important. <clears throat> and in some senses, it, in some sense, you might say it is the most important because it creates the structure of the painting. But I wouldn't say that, uh, I would say that it's most important, but the others are very important. Uh, okay, so let's see. What do you think about that? Uh, I don't know. I hope I didn't, um, I, I hope I didn't teeter-totter too much on that. Sometimes uh, we can fall in love with a process and then we will claim it the most important or the, or the best way of doing something. And it ain't necessarily always so. But I do think we have to give a lot of credence to value contrast because just because value contrast itself and to the degree it's contrasted enables us to see the whole thing. Uh, and it will, it will often determine Value, the, the, the how value contrast is handled. I'm going to make one here, a real, real a judgmental statement here, but it really often will determine the success of a painting to the degree something is contrasted or how, how a painting, uh, how value contrast is used in a painting. So we're coming up, we're coming up on the tail end of this thing now, folks. Do you have, uh, are there any other questions? Have I left you in doubt in any way? Uh, are there any other questions or um, any other comments that that uh, you'd like to to add or whatever? Uh, so I don't see any questions coming in, and I and don't. Uh, oh, here comes one. <laughs> I highly recommend Diane's workshop. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And no, Diane hasn't asked me to say that. No, I didn't. I didn't tell you not to either. <laughs> Okay, Eve says, thank you so much, enjoy, good, wonderful. Listen, folks, don't just let this one dangle as a, as a fond memory. Uh, go play with this stuff, go practice this stuff. Just by starting with your own environment, you can do it wherever you are, you, wherever you're looking, you're gonna see color, probably, unless, unless you're looking at something that doesn't have any color. And well, we won't go there either. Anyway, uh, but you can always start with wherever you're looking. And then, um, then think about those three ways that color, uh, that we use color to compose with, that we, of course we're describing, of course we're describing, but it's the, uh, the color also is aiding our eye to flow throughout the painting, helping to guide the eye, and the color is harmonizing. Harmony, the harmonizing is one of the real big ones because that color harmony is what tells us the color of the light that shine, that's, that's illuminating whatever you're looking at. Very, very important. All right, so um, thank you for wonderful information. You're welcome, you're welcome. Ch very challenging, Carolyn says. Yes, it is challenging, but what fun. You don't have to take it, you don't have to uh, feel like you, you don't have to develop a command of the whole thing at one time and just start in one place. Maybe just start with one color or maybe just start with uh, in your uh, in an area that you choose where you just take yourself through trying to mix the colors you're looking at. Ah, serendipity. Thank you so much for that tip. What are those tips called again? Roger? Super thanks. Super thanks. Super thanks. Thank you so much. I think maybe we'll go out and get some coffee. <laughs> okay, folks. Got to, got to wrap this one up. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, your questions are really good, uh, stimulating, and of course they got me going. So anytime you can keep me going, you're, we're, we're doing well, right? All right. And thanks to Roger as always. He sort of, he's in the background here. He's he's got the he's he's steering all the activity and making this happen. So okay, 
uh, look for when the chat will be in February. It will be either the third or the fourth Sunday. We haven't really decided yet. But just keep your eye open. And again, thanks and bye-bye for now.